So tonight, we will hear presentations from Bo Sulaiman and our chairman of trustees, Professor Mohammed Abdullah Halim OBE, who is renowned around the world, mashallah, for his groundbreaking and now best-selling translation of the Quran in modern English, and it's published by Oxford um, University Press. You have copies here. Most of you have seen them or already have them. I've seen some really amazingly uh, well-used copies, mashallah. <laughs> um, and obviously, he's uh, published many other publications relating to translating and interpreting the Quran. Some of you are familiar with those. Professor Abdel Halim was born in Egypt in 1930. Really? No. <laughs> you, you forgot. <laughs> 31? 33, I think. 33, sorry. Sorry, I've made him a bit older than he is. So 33. And he learned the Quran by heart during his childhood, and he became a Hafiz. He then went on to study at Al-Hazar University and completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge. He has lectured at SOAS since 1971. He was appointed an officer of the Order of the British Empire in the Queen's 2008 Birthday Honours, in recognition of his services to Arabic culture, literature, and to interfaith understanding. As for Laman Ball, he was born in Oxford in 1971, and Harfia Halim is uh, his mother. He's the son of English converts to Islam. He has been dedicating a good part of his adult life, spreading the message of Islam through various platforms, one of which is probably the first ever Dawah website in 1995 called islamic.org.uk, which was then translated into six other European languages, including French. Uh, he now mainly writes a blog called investigatingislam.org. He holds a Master's of Physics from the University of Manchester and works as an IT consultant. In 2014, he set up the Public Quran Campaign to help educate the public to correct various uh, misunderstandings about Islam and about religion in general by placing verses of the Quran in English into public spaces. He will tell you more about this himself. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am really very pleased to be here with you tonight coming from London earlier in the day, and I was so pleased to come to Manchester. But when I was brought into this room and saw all the knives and forks, I said, this is a great promise here uh, of some lovely iftar, which we will have together, inshallah. Now, the, we are in Ramadan, as you all know. And Ramadan in Arabic is called the month of the Quran and the month of Sawm. Really? It's not off, it's just. As I said, you see. It's fine. It's just trying to speak more directly into the mic. Let's just try. Uh, okay. It will, it will be better after the food, you see. <laughs> <laughs> now, as I said, in Arabic, Ramadan is called the month of the Quran because it was in the Quran. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, it was in Ramadan that the month of the Quran was revealed when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was not a prophet then, was retreating in Ghar Hira, the cave, and in the middle of the night, the angel Gabriel came and approached him and said to him, Iqra' bismi rabbika. Iqra' bismi rabbika. Read or recite. Iqra' in Arabic can mean recite and read as well. Bismi Rabbika, in the name of your Lord, who created you. Iqra, Bismi Rabbika. That was 1457 years ago. It was that event which started Islam. 
Islam started with Iqra. Bismi Rabbika. It was that event which made Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Rasulullah. Before Iqra, Bismi Rabbika, he was an ordinary man. By receiving this revelation, he became Muhammad Rasulullah. So you are all here tonight to celebrate the event of the revelation of the Quran, to celebrate the event at which Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was made Rasulullah. Very nice and lovely occasion indeed. Now, it was the Quran who started it. And that is why we read in the Quran, Yaseen wal Quran al Hakim innaka la min al Mursaleen. When the Arabs did not accept the message of Islam at first, and they could not accept that Muhammad was a messenger of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to swear, to swear, Yaseen wal Quran al Hakim. I swear, God says, I swear by this decisive or perfect Qur'an that you, Muhammad, is one of the messengers of Allah. Okay, so as I said, it was the Qur'an. The Qur'an is the most important thing in the Muslim's life, really and truly. It was, it was the Qur'an who made us Muslims and made us follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is why it is our duty all the time to do something about the Quran. First of all is to learn some Quran ourselves and teach it to our children, okay? But apart from that, Muslims are called upon to call on others, to invite them and call them to this Qur'an, give them a feeling of what this Kalamullah is about. We are here in a country which naturally they are not Muslims. The vast majority of the British people, God bless them all, they are not Muslim. Many of them perhaps never touched the Quran, the, the translation of the Quran, and many of them have strange views about the Quran. If you ask any ordinary Muslim about the Quran or about Islam, they have very strange views. That is why it is our duty as Muslims in this country to do something to make these people know something about the Qur'an. And Laman has thought of this ingenious project called Public Qur'an to write some short verses from the Qur'an on a panel, on a board, and display it in important public places. So that Muslims or non-Muslims will obviously notice what is this and read a verse of the Quran. An excellent, ingenious, I say, I don't know, yani of getting people who are not Muslim and not Arabs or not anything to look at a board and read one verse of the Quran. That is why we all need to support this public Quran campaign, a man calls it. He told me, I knew, I knew for the first time this evening that I am actually the chairman of the board <laughs> of the public Quran. And this is a very great honor. We do our best. Alhamdulillah, I started my life in a small school, Quran school in Egypt, and learned the Quran by heart. After that, I went to study in Al-Azhar schools, and then the, and the, the most important thing was, you see, the qualification for entry to this school was to know the Quran by heart. 
the Alhamdulillah, ever since I have read the Quran, because my father, who was also a Hafiz and was educated at Al Azhar, made me promise him that I will read something of the Quran every day. And this was many, many years ago. During the, during, it was during the 30th or early 40th. And since that time, alhamdulillah ta'ala, I read a juz of the Quran every day. And because I know it by heart, I don't have to be sitting and looking. I read my juz today on the fast train from London to Manchester. <coughs> now, after that, I يعني, have learned and studied Islam in Egypt. It was my يعني, good luck, maybe, to be sent to study in Cambridge for a PhD. I was sent to study literature, actually, Arabic literature. It was very useful for me, because I read English literature, and this affected my sense of English. <coughs> my sense of English, what is good English at that time. And started teaching Arabic and some Islam at Cambridge and then London University, School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, at first, I was just teaching, la teaching language and literature. But then I woke up to the fact that people around me, they call Orientalists, non-Muslims, writing about the Quran, teaching the Quran, I said, what a shame on me to have been brought up with the Quran and reading it every day and leave that and talk about literature. So I decided to turn to talking about teaching the Quran. <coughs> um, and this has been for going on for, for years at Suez. I would say at least for about 40 years ago. And then, and one of my, when I first came to this country to teach Arabic and Islam, some Islam, I had, I still remember the first class was about 14 students, only one Muslim girl whose father had been in this country. For that. All the others were non-Muslim. That perhaps was useful for me because it made me realize how I speak to non-Muslim rather than to Muslims, okay? And then <coughs> when I came to London and started teaching the Quran, I said to my students, by that time, by the way, that shows you how things have changed immensely. One student in Cambridge was Muslim in my class. Now, the vast majority of my students are Muslims from the second generation, whether Arabs or Muslims. The vast majority of them are Muslims. Alhamdulillah, this is a big change. Our Muslim communities, and yeah, Alhamdulillah, Urdu, Indian, and so on, and others, bringing their children or to study Islam at source. So I was to my great luck, I think. Oxford University Press was searching for a translator to produce a new translation. And they came and approached me. I said, great, I would do that. Then I went to my students and said to them, asked them, what is the best translation you like among the existing translation? my great surprise, they said, we do not. They did not read the existing translations. I said, why? They said they were written in a language which we hadn't read at school, and we do not read at university. It is, and many of them said, I remember one <coughs> girl who originally Egyptian, and her father had been living in Canada with them. And she said, my father would bring me a, a copy of the Quran and ask me to read. I look at it, and I will put off, and so I put it on the shelf. So I said to them, OK, I will do something. I translated one page and said to the class, the class was students, mainly MA in Islamic studies 
and PhD also in the Quran and the Islamic study. I wrote a, a copy, a page, and said to them, read this. <coughs> Come next week and tell me what you think of it. They came next week, they said, well, better, but it is still like the old one, this and this and that. So I said, fine. Took it away, rewrote it, and gave it to them again. And said, they said, it's better now. I, 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 I repeated the exercise about three times until they said, this is the style we can understand and we can appreciate and like. So Alhamdulillah, my translation thus was made uh, as a result of market research, if you like. <laughs> it was very useful for me to see these English speakers, educated Muslims and some non-Muslims, who told me that this is the style. They want me to write the translation of the Quran. <coughs> you see? So I did finish it and gave it to Oxford University Press. It was the first time, what was 19? No, 2004. 2004. To my amazing surprise, it had been received with great appreciation and praise. I'm not claiming this. Emails coming to me from different people, some non-Muslim, one man claiming that he became Muslim <laughs> as a result of my reading the Quran. I have received emails from Jews, from Christians, from Hindu, and so on, uh, who said that this is the... See, my, my, my decision was to translate the Quran into English, not into Arabic English. And this is what many translators do. They hold the material Quran in Arabic and translate read the English and you find the same word order of the Arabic, which makes it foreign. Makes it foreign. Makes people who are even non-Muslim would say, well, this, this, this is a text that belongs to the Middle East just as Islam is the religion of those who are there in the Middle East, not for us. My task was who makes them do something which will make them feel that this is actually English. And when I first, you see, brought it, and so as I introduced it to my, one of my colleagues, English colleague, she looked at it and read a few things. This is great. It flows. It flows. The Quran flows in English. Now, before that, they said it did not flow in English because Translators are, are in the habit of being literalists. They go, go, go word by word. I could not do that and produce an English style. Not verse by verse and say verse number one, and when I finish the full stop, go back from the beginning of the side of the line, verse number two. One of my brilliant students said the Quran clunks. And this translation, it's like driving a tractor over a pumpy road. You see? That is the feeling. Mind flows. It is coherent. Coherent. It has rhythm. Rhythm is vital in the Arabic Quran. You see? To make it... So I, I, I did it by, by paragraph, not by, by verse. Paragraph. And alhamdulillah, I produced some little introduction because the Quran was speaking to Arabs who knew at the time yani when the Prophet وسلم, read to them, they knew what he was talking about because the Quran is talking about an event that happened in their society or someone objected and this and so on. They knew what was going on. The Quran doesn't start by saying, these people object and say we do not understand. Doesn't. It doesn't gives its text. And the Prophet ﷺ was very loyal, absolutely, to the Quran. Gabriel comes in, reads to him, and this has been described by people around the Prophet in something called the state of the revelation of the Quran, where the Prophet would fall silent all of a sudden and sweat. And there is something like 
humming sound if you are close to him and if you are next to him you see his body becoming very heavy for a few moments it left and he read the new material that Gabriel the state of the revelation was so hard, hard on him physically even and then he read the Quran without adding or saying we said yesterday or by the way as we said in page 15 nothing nothing what Gabriel has delivered and I had to make some introduction to the surahs and a few notes a few footnotes simply to say why is this stated next to that the other Muslims Muslim translators they are most of them of course are very keen and they preach to the reader say to them look how the Quran is great in this some will even say the end the, the gospel says so and so but look at this and propagate I am a professor in a respectable university I cannot propagate Islam my propagation is to produce produce what will convince them what they will feel impressive because the Quran is impactful in Arabic Arab Muslims and non-Muslim right from the beginning so that this is <coughs> it's a great beyond anybody's around them it is definitely different from the hadith of the prophet the hadith is the prophet's own language sitting with his friends companions talking and they ask him questions and he answer and some of them comment none of this in the Quran delivery comes straight from the angel of revelation and appears as such I have some time to say why this is stated here because and you see or to refer to something else or because sometimes I had to produce meaning uh, translations which is different I had sometimes to justify what was happening that is what my these are my notes these are my notes and they are meant not for Muslims I meant them for non-Muslim English or German or German or American Muslims of course know the Quran and they can read it some of them in Arabic but what we need my friends my brothers and sisters is to make this readable in English and this is what I tried and after every now and again I keep making some new amendments there are four editions by now more are coming inshallah because the Quran is just an amazing text <coughs> which <coughs> sometimes I said she can hear me in one day or one morning I stand up and said amazing did I have to wait 80 years to realize that this verse means such and such because now I realize it the Quran reveals it reveals it is a revelation to the Prophet it reveals itself to us gradually more and more that's what I could I had to do this I consider alhamdulillah my greatest and yani that's the greatest thing I have done is to have produced this this text if I hadn't I would have said my time here is wasted why did I stay here and not go back to the village when I was in the village I used to look at my teacher in the primary school and see how great to be a teacher in the primary school like this man this was ultimate <laughs> objective at that time alhamdulillah I feel that having come here and did something like this and this is what we need to do we need all of us the man is doing something very great we really need to think again and again and again how to make this make the Quran present it to people who may appreciate it this is what I want we need Quran some little Quran for children we need Quran 
for secondary school and then we read Quran for the university student because to go to a child living in England and say to him take the ilaf Quraysh or tabbat yada because it is a short text they think that being a short surah it will be easy for children it cannot be you have to select I have seen I have seen something done somewhere in this country. Beautiful picture for the children and a verse in Arabic and lovely, simple translation. That we need more of this. Do as much as you can. If you can't do it yourself, tell other people to do it or contribute if they are trying to do it. I'm not asking you, alhamdulillah, to contribute to me because I already have uh, um, university salary and so on and this is not although I never looked or thought of how it would sell it is selling extremely well making me nearly rich <laughs> compared to what I was before it came to me Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Sallallahu Alaihi Sayyidina Muhammad I believe that there will be a session of question and answer uh, I will be waiting for that but I'm also, above all, waiting for the meal. <laughs> for the meal. <laughs> okay, um, so just a little introduction to the Public Crown Campaign as an idea and uh, where it came from. Um, I remember when I was back as a student in Manchester University, back in the early 90s, um, there was a, a time when it was the introduction of the National Lottery people are familiar with that. That was the first time that Britain introduced gambling in the National Lottery. And much to everyone's uh, surprise, the first winner who won the biggest massive jackpot of 17 million pounds, which was worth a bit more then, but still, that's a lot of money, um, was a Muslim. And uh, it was kind of a crisis in the community. And uh, if older people around here will remember that. But I remember uh, in Manchester being taken to a, a darkest how live program to like a bit like um there's a media thing i don't know what you'd call it like it's a bit like a uh, a big chat show and panel thing where they would ask the audience to participate and so on and i went along with a couple of friends of mine who are from manchester um and i i thought well i'll take along a quran and like here's the, here's the two verses that say gambling is from the devil from satan and it's like I'll, I'll i'll take that in and see what see what they do it's like you know, there's no, there's no debate about it. It's in the Quran. And, and the, when I walked in with the Quran, uh, the producer who saw me said, you're not quoting from that. And I thought, and I remembered that, and it stuck with me. And I've noticed, as you look in the media, and you look at how they talk about Islam a lot, talk about Muslim this, talk about Muslim that, but they almost never go into what does the Quran actually say. And, and this... this uh, this, this is, uh, I think there's, there's a reasons for that, some of which you can say conspiratorially, but essentially media is interested in a debate. They want lots of fire and lots, lots of heat, but not necessarily much light. And the Quran brings light and brings answers, and, and, and when you've presented the truth, then the, the falsehood has nowhere to go. It's, 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 just, it's destroyed. And so people, a lot of the media, they're not interested in actually getting to the truth. They're interested in getting people excited. And so their function, you know, you want people to be paying attention. You want to grab people's attention all the time. And uh, it's not the same motivation as actually conveying the truth. And so getting the Quran into the public discourse, getting it into what happens in public places, um, I thought was such an important point. We have we do lots of things uh, in the Muslim community to try and promote Islam in various ways. I mean, this, this is the British Muslim Heritage Centre is, is an example of that. We have a big centre, it's got Muslim written on the thing, but we talk about heritage and that seems to be sometimes a sort of safe thing we can talk about because it's, it's the past. But the Muslim, Muslim heritage should be about the future as well. We should be leaving a heritage for our children. And part of that is to convey the message of Islam effectively uh, through making sure that the Quran is the, the core of that message, not uh, secondary opinions and tertiary opinions, but 
the actual Quran and what it, what it means and, and get that message out there. So I we set this up uh, quite a few years ago and we tried various things. We did, we did a series of, of uh, uh, bus abbots where we had the Surat Ikhlas on the back of buses around Manchester for a while. And uh, we worked a lot on the translation of that. And it was quite interesting because you try and get the translation. And this is where I work a lot with Professor Halim, is to, is to work on the translation and, and to refine it and to make it so that if you put it on its own without anything else, it still, you know, it, it, it stands on its own. And uh, so you can't rely on someone having, relying on someone having read the previous surah or the next section or, or, or even the rest of the verse sometimes. So um, just think if I can remember the verse, uh, how we translated Surah Ikhlas. Um, uh, say God is one, God needs no one, never a father, never a son, beyond compare with anyone. So it had a, got all the rhythm in there and the rhyme like, it's, just, it's repetitive and very strong. And, and it's, it, it really, I think, we worked quite well on that. And that was nice. We did that for a while. That was something we did. But then the idea, I looked into the issue of putting signs on things. And it's, it's very expensive to pay for billboards or pay for signs commercially. But every religious building in the UK, at least, has the right to put, like a church has outside the church, the big sign like this, sort of that wide and that tall. And you can say a message about the church, as Jesus saves or something like that. They have, these, they have these messages. And every religious building has that right. And Muslims could be using that right outside every mosque to put a verse of Quran out there to the public. So I looked at this, no planning, no planning requirement required, 1.2 square meters, you can have a sign outside every mosque with a verse of Quran. So I said, okay, let's do that. And I thought, this is great. Because Quran, what is a sign of Quran? What is a sign? An ayah is a sign. All right, this is what, this is what it's about. It's, it's a perfect match of what, what the Quran is. It is a proclamation to the world. It is a statement given out to the world about something that we need to know. It is a sign. The ayah are signs. So we want Quran signs outside mosques to convey the message of Islam through key verses of the Quran, which, which are important. So we've had the um, first one we did. Uh, my local mosque in Eccles, we have a sign there, we have the chairman here tonight and others from the mosque community, um, which is uh, a surah from uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, a verse from Surah Al-Baqarah, I can't have the whole surah, that's a bit much, um, <laughs> um, which says, uh, whoever turns to God in submission will have uh, his reward from his Lord. So this is, there's a lot more context to that, you know, about it's the Christians say only they will get to paradise and, and, and say, no, whoever, whoever believes in God and does good deeds will have his reward from his Lord. And they will not grieve and they will not fear. And there's a lot more to it. But it's, it's an important verse because people uh, have this idea that, you know, we're, we're very exclusivist. But no, the Quran is very inclusivist. As long as you are sincerely trying to obey Allah, Aslam Wajihi is another thing about how to translate this phrase. In Arabic, it literally means to submit your face. It doesn't mean much in English. But in Arabic, the whole face is the whole, you know, who you are. And, and so if you just turn yourself in submission to God, this is, uh, you have to think about how to translate these. And it does take a little bit of effort to get it right, to make it clear and uh, conveying the message quite well. So, inshallah, so we've, we've done this and we've got a few mosques now. We have Palmer's Green down in London. We have Didsbury Mosque as well. If you see there, there's a sign from the public run campaign there. And we're in com we have now finally got, got a bit more motivation going. We've got uh, employed a, a new member of staff. He couldn't be here today because he's fundraising madly for all sorts of things. It's on Islam channel every other, other day or something. Um, anyway, he's, he's helping us and he's been in conversation with lots of mosques up and down the country. I was talking to Aberdeen Mosque yesterday and, and others to try and get them to agree to, take, to have signs. We pay for everything and there's no planning permission for this type of sign. So if, you, if your local mosque uh, has a good signage place outside the main street or I think Aberdeen one, they have one right in the city centre so it's an ideal location. We can get a sign up there. It doesn't cost a lot of money, and we pay for everything. All you need to do is say, put a sign there, and you know, authorized by the mosque committee. And we'll do it. Um, so we do that. Um, there are other things also. We have lots of ideas about how you get the Quran into public spaces, because it's not as simple, just the signs is one thing, but there's a lots of way, other ways we can get the Quran into public places. We can just take Qurans and put good translations and put them into public places, including mosques, where they don't often have good, good translations, or at least not many, and just give copies to the mosques. 
So we want to do that. Um, and we've done a couple already. We'd like to do a lot more. Um, you know, if you go into a hotel room, most places in the world, you'll find a Bible. Why don't you find a Quran? We should get a Quran into every hotel room in the world if we can. These are big projects. It could be a very big project. A lot could be done with it. And also with mosques, um, we have the idea of... If you go to Cambridge Mosque, it's a brand new mosque. It's a lovely mosque. It's a beautiful mosque. It has Allahu Ahad written into the bricks. Big, big bricks over a massive wall, bigger than the walls of all of this hall. And yet nothing in English from the Quran. So it's an amazing opportunity that could have been taken to put God is one alongside Allahu Ahad. And that would have communicated to the world something very fundamental about Islam. And it's, it's a missed opportunity. And we want to try and, inshallah, help that. And uh, we spoke, I spoke earlier with uh, Professor, uh, with, uh, no, with Nasser Mahmoud, he's here. Um, about there's plans for this place. We're, we're going to build a big mosque and inshallah we'll try and get the Quran in English as translations alongside the Arabic as decoration for that mosque as part of the, the planning permission, as part of the mosque itself so that it speaks to the public. Anyone who comes into the building will see this here and see this there. And we can do this also inside mosques and inside other places to put verses of Quran in English in many places. So we have lots of ideas. Um, uh, it's and it's a lot of uh, getting some work done and trying to persuade people to, to kind of just give us the time of day to listen. And we will pay for everything. That's what the goal is. And uh, we'll try and get, raise the money to, to do whatever we, we need to do in that process. Alhamdulillah, I've put some, some of my, quite a bit of my money into it now. And inshallah, uh, we'll get some more money and we'll get the thing really moving fast. So I'm very uh, happy to have you all here. And thank you very much for coming. Um, uh, there's a lot more I could say. There's, of course, uh, I would say, if you look on your um, table, somewhere on the table, if you look at the end of this table, here, there's these little QR codes, which you can just scan and make a donation or make a regular um, thing. You see that on the tables up, and there's a few on the tables here. If you could do that at some point in the evening, that would be great, alhamdulillah. But mostly, we want you to get the word out, tell people about it, encourage your local mosque to get in touch. There's a website, publicquorancampaign.org. And you can uh, find uh, things on there and you can get in touch with us and tell us about your local mosque and encourage your local mosque or other public place that you're involved with, maybe your workplace, if you work, say, in a hospital or something. There might be ways you could get Qurans into the, the, the little prayer room there or, or, or other things which, which can help get that message out and also into the reading rooms of libraries or schools. Or, uh, there's lots of ways we can try and uh, help get the Quran out into, in, into people's you know, physical spaces, so that into public spaces. So I think uh, I'll, I'll wind up there and um, we could, how long have we got for questions? I think we have, we, have a, we have about 10 minutes, but just to finish on the social media presence, we have an Instagram account, which is the, at the Public Run Campaign. We have a Facebook page, Public Run Campaign. Um, so if you've taken any pictures tonight, please tag us on everything. It'd be lovely to see a little bit of that. Um, Connection. Um, we have a YouTube, YouTube channel as well. Oh yes, I should say I should mention a bit more about the YouTube. Last Ramadan, we did a number of YouTube uh, interviews uh, on the, on the subject of my chosen verse. So we, we interviewed a number of key people, um, including um, uh, Lauren Booth and Yvonne Ridley and uh, Ahmed Thompson and uh, various various people who are well known. Um, and we're trying to get more videos this Ramadan. So if you have any connections and contacts you could use to give us uh, people who would ready to do that. We just basically ask them to choose a verse, tell, them, tell us what, what, why it had a particular impact for them. And we bring the, the Quran into discussion about, about you know, how it changes people's lives, what it means to people, how it uh, impacts people. So we did, we did, I think, one every other day last Ramadan. I don't think we'll manage that this Ramadan. But inshallah, we'll do a few. We've done Yvonne Ridley already. The new one up today or yesterday. Uh, from Yvonne Ridley, where she talks about a verse that she's particularly interested in at the moment. Um, and inshallah, we'll have a lot more. Thank you, Thank you very much. Oh, you want to say something? Sure. Yes. If you look at this table, there are three people here. This great lady, her faith, myself, and her son, Naman. I would like to thank this very great lady for her help with the translation of her husband, Produce the translation of the Quran, and her son is running the public Quran campaign. Alhamdulillah.
so okay. never despair when you have teenagers and challenge the Quran, challenge you, challenge Islam. Laman was one of those. And mm -hmm. perseverance and patience and yeah, just trust in Allah. Now you have Laman doing this sort of thing. So trust in your children, guide them, give them strength and inspiration. But they can uh, they can be challenging and then surprise you quite a lot. <laughs> but yeah, remember uh, have here like over the years when they were translating and they're spending hours and hours locked in the bedroom and debating about a tiny little bit of the absolutely essential word in English. So yes, a lot of times I've got them tears have gone through. Yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> probably. Thank you so much um, for listening. So if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to just raise your hand. Uh, brother, Thomas. Yeah, question for Tessie. Yeah, just, uh, j just speak mm. loudly. We'll repeat it if needed. Okay, I'll try. Um, you know, when, trans when translating a lot of verses, uh, most translations, they differ from each other, uh, especially in English. And uh, particularly certain verses, for example, which I personally, being a non-Arab, can understand, like, you know, uh, it is translated as Allah wishes. Now, Allah can't have a wish, but all, most translators will say Allah wishes, or Allah desires, or, or like, inshallah, Allah desires. But you see, like Christian and Jews, they do the similar words, they translate it as the will of God. So why can't we adopt this good habit from them? I see. Uh, so I repeat the question. Irada is not wish. Allah can't have a wish. Wish can be fulfilled or okay. not fulfilled. The question is how, how, how do we translate the phrase uh, why you read? Man yurid illahu. Okay. <coughs> well, why, why can we not say God wishes? The wish can be fulfilled or not fulfilled. fulfilled. No, wish no one can thwart God's power. wishes, you see. Do you wish something because you don't have power? <coughs> What do you suggest we say? Will, will of God. Will? Yes. If God will, yeah. Which Christian who uses it? Very difficult to make it into a verb in English because it's not used like that anymore. That's it, you see? And he, my, and he questioned like this. Are they really valid in one, in one angle? But there are other considerations to, to take into account. The readability in English, not Arabic English, and the impact, impact. But of course, single words can be argued about for a long time. <laughs> thank you for my, thank you for asking the question. Question here. I want to ask if, if um, the professor was to choose his ayah for your project. All right. <laughs> what's your what's your, uh, your uh, I think he actually did a video. We did a video on your cho chosen verse, didn't we? Did I? Yes. Please uh, <laughs> forget. Um, oh, I see. There are interviews of the professor, uh, of Professor Wilhelm on YouTube. But yeah, now you've been put on the spot. I think uh, he had so many. He just picked one what of many. What a very. <laughs> you see. Okay. You can choose what which verse in the Quran pops into your head right now. You are a woman. What the Quran says about women at the beginning of Surah An Nisa. Beautiful. One thing about the Quran, it doesn't throw orders at people. It, if it gives a commandment, it gives the reason for them. The last verse in Surah Yasin, I was reading this morning on the train. It instructs the Prophet, وَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرٍ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ كُلُّ شَيْءٍ هَالِكٌ إِلَّا وَجْهَهُ لَهُ الْحُكْ وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ It says to him, do not call on any other than God, إله, other God. That was in context, of course, because all the Meccans were talking about their gods. The Quran tells Muhammad وسلم, do not call on any other deity than God. Okay? Then it doesn't stop there. 
It gives reason. Reason number one. La ilaha illa huwa. There is no God but him. Number one. Number two. كل شيء هالك إلا وجهه. Everything will perish except his majestic face. So this is one reason you should call only on him. كل شيء هالك إلا وجهه. Third reason. لا الحق. Judgment belongs to him and to no one else. And the final reason, وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ And to him, that will be taken back. Reasons for everything. You see, when it talks about the unity of God, the Quran has to give reason. Why this is so? And this is what we should begin to learn how to read. How to read. This is good. You see, I will again, Ya see. والقرآن الحكيم إنك لمن المرسلين. I always said Yasir by the great Quran you are one of the messengers. Only today I said look it's well that he is one of the messengers by the Quran because it is the Quran that proves that he is the messenger of God. We need to learn really and truly. I am learning it regularly. We need, it would be great to sit oh, and take some short verses, ask you all to read them at home, and come here before a meal and read together. Explain why. It's so great, and it, when it comes to this, I begin to ask, uh, uh, which is better than other? They are all better than other. <coughs> Thank you. Very good question, and also the other one here. We learn from your question. We learn, I learn from your objection. <laughs> yes. Is there any possibility in the future to have an online academy where there will be some competitions to refine? Online? Uh, Can I? To refine the translation of the Quran better and better, for example. In the Surah of Man, it said, I am Baba Yahi Allah, I rabbi kumat It can be translated in a different way, but one of the translations which I heard, which still stuck to me, is too blessed to be stressed. Mm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> these are departure. You see, I am, I am a professor. I am not free just to say anything. I have to be respectable and translate only what is there as it is there, in English, in English. Uh, can I just draw your attention to something? We could even hear it while you are reading. There is a, an audible version of this translation, an audible version, beautifully read, as everybody said, by my son Ayman. <laughs> if you like, I can read just two or three verses for you. Shall I? Okay. Bismillah. Uh, I think this can. Put it right against the The guilt of the alteration will fall on them. God is all hearing and all knowing. But if anyone knows that the testator has made a mistake or done wrong, and so puts things right between the parties, yes. he will incur no sin. God is most forgiving and merciful. You who believe, fasting is prescribed for you, as it was prescribed for those before you, so that you may be mindful of God. Fast for a specific number of days. But if one of you is ill or on a journey, then on other days later, for those who can fast only with extreme difficulty, there is a way to compensate. Feed a needy person. But if anyone does good of his own accord, it is better for him. And fasting is better for you, if only you knew. It was in the month of Ramadan that the Qur'an was revealed as guidance for mankind. Clear messages giving guidance, and distinguishing between right and wrong. So any one of you who sees in that month should fast, 
and anyone who is ill or on a journey should make up for the lost days by fasting on other days later. God wants ease for you. Oh, good. That's not it. It really is a very. I mean, have, he wants you to not just my my my, my assertion, but many people have said that very nicely read by this reader, audible, and I think you can buy it for about eight pounds. So basically, this was an audible version, a read of the actual Quran, but it's read by Professor Ben Son Island. I think the van is going to go in like a few seconds. So I am, I am humbled. My wife helped with the translation. I did the translation. My son read the translation, and my son, the man, is doing a public Quran. So I think the van will go very shortly. So if you want to just pause now and make a few du'a, and then we can. I think we'll be able to hear the van from outside. Um, so if, if not, someone can stand up and do it then. Seems to put it back here. Yeah. Uh, I don't think. So. 